Well, good morning, and it's good to see your faces. You'll notice the backdrop has changed. I've just moved along the wall a little bit. You can tell me whether you prefer this one or the yellow one at the end of the service. It's lovely as I look out at your faces because I can visualize many of you in this building and I know where you sit. There are some who don't have a regular place in this building. And it's great that you're here too, to worship. Because God brings us all together to worship, to praise his name. I'd like to read a few verses from Psalm 84. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favour and honour. No good thing does he withhold from those whose way of life is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. None of us is blameless, but we can be made blameless, we can be made clean if we confess our sin and turn from it. And our theme of worship this morning is confession. We're thinking about a particular prayer of confession that we find in scripture. We're also thinking how we can go to our loving Heavenly Father at any time. This is Father's Day. For some, it's a day of regret. For some, it's a day of remembering. For some, it's a day of being with the Father. Our Heavenly Father is always with us and he will never let us down. So let's praise him as we sing together how deep the Father's love for us. Li Ming is going to lead us in prayer. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, proclaiming your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night to the music of a ten-string lyre and the melody of the harp. For you make me glad by your deeds, Lord. I sing for joy at what your hands have done. How great are your works, Lord, how profound your thoughts. Father, we thank you that we can come to you in prayer and have a relationship with you. Forgive us that we are not always mindful of you and your provisions, but help us in this. Help us to know you and love you and those you put around us. Help us to be good stewards of the things that you have given us. Thank you for the world and help us to see beyond our doors and to love and to care as you do. We pray for justice and equality across the lands that reflect the values of your kingdom. Father, we pray for the world during this pandemic. We pray for a love and care for each other to share resources and move forward together. We pray for supplies of vaccines to reach all who need it and countries would set aside political and financial concerns to share resources. We pray for struggling countries like Brazil, Nepal and India. We ask for your hand in this situation. We lift up to you the government, the medical staff, the organisations and the people and we pray for your peace and hope across the world at this time. As we all face varying levels of change, challenges and struggles, we pray you will help us to look to you in these times for hope, strength and wisdom, and above all, place in us a desire to put you first and to seek to serve you in where you have put us. Forgive us that we don't always spend time listening to you as church and individuals. Help us to stop and listen that we can walk with you and in your will. Unite as your people, your church to stand for you. Help us to know how to be there for each other. Help us to journey together through the next pandemic phase as a congregation. Thank you that we can come together to worship you and in prayer and to call you Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Lee Ming, for leading us in prayer and reminding us of the, the goodness of God and uh, our need of him. Well, we've all done it. Something we knew was wrong. Maybe we've even done it this morning. And we've probably felt guilty about it, even if nobody else knew. A 
parent, sneaking into the child's sweet jar and eating some sweets and not confessing, not admitting to it. And the child thinking, that's strange. Where have my sweets gone? Or a worker saying, oh yeah, I, I finished that, I completed that, it's done. Knowing full well that it was half started or maybe not started at all. It was a lie. Or breaking something and blaming somebody else. Maybe even the dog. Oh, it wasn't me. And when we've done something like that, and I've deliberately chosen probably not too serious examples, we do feel guilty, or at least we should feel guilty. We might distance ourselves from the person that we've wronged. We might hope that we don't bang into them too many times. We might cringe anytime somebody talks about that guilt in their own life. Or we hear a story on the radio or there's something on television and inwardly we cringe because we know we were guilty. We know we did exactly the same. And we know that the root of our wrongdoing, more often than not, is self. Self-interest, self-preservation, self-desire, self-centeredness. When we give into it, and all sorts of things can happen. Now, you know that I quite like a good television cop drama. And I'm fascinated the way the police try to get the culprit to confess because it's so much easier then. You know, confess, just admit it. Not so that the individual will feel better, but so that they can get the case closed as quickly as possible and get the individual sent off to court. But confessing doesn't mean we won't do the same again. There are serial offenders. Serial offenders in the terms of the police and courts. Serial offenders in the case of repeated sin against God. I love the story of the child and, and in their house there was the naughty step. You were sent to the naughty step if you'd done something wrong. And this wee girl took herself off to the naughty step because she'd been angry with her wee brother and she'd shouted at him. So she went and sat on the naughty step and took some time out without being told, which was fine because she was admitting, she was recognizing that she'd done something wrong. But of course the challenge is, how many times did she need to go to that naughty step before she actually changed her behavior. Because that's what confession is about. When we feel guilty and when we confess, really we should then be wanting to change and not to repeat the offense again. Now our reading today comes from Psalm 51, and I'm sure it will be familiar to many of you. It's the Psalm in which David confesses his sin to God, his adultery with Bathsheba. God knew about it, because you can't hide from God. And it was God who had instructed Nathan the prophet to go to David and to get him to realize what he'd done and that God knew, so that he would deal with it before God. We're going to read the psalm in two parts, uh, and we will look at the two parts, because the first part is very much about confession, and then the second part is very much about what happens once David has confessed? So Margaret's going to read for us just now the first part of the psalm, Psalm 51, verses 1 to 6. Thanks, Margaret. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. And my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict, 
and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Thank you, Margaret. And Dave will read for us the second part of the psalm a little later on. So when David was asking for mercy, he used three words to describe his wrongdoing. I don't know if you noticed that. He used the word transgression, he used the word iniquity, and he used the word sin. And we might think, well, they all mean the same thing. And to some extent they do. They all mean getting things wrong and disobeying God in some way. But there are very subtle differences between transgression, iniquity, and sin. And the Bible Project have put together three videos to help us understand them. Now, I have taken some of those videos and put them together so that we don't have to watch 15 minutes. We just watch about five minutes to help us understand the difference between transgression, iniquity, and sin. Now, if you want to look at the three individual videos, you'll find them on the Bible Project website. But those three words, transgression, iniquity, and sin. So transgression, that's the betrayal of the relationship. So if we think about David, who is saying he has transgressed, he has betrayed a relationship with his friend, Uriah the Hittite. He committed adultery with his friend's wife. That's a deep betrayal of a relationship. But he'd also betrayed his army, the relationship that he had with them, because as king, he was meant to be leading them into battle. But at the time of seeing Bathsheba, he wasn't there with his troops. He wasn't leading them as he was meant to. For some reason, he just decided to stay at home in the palace and let them get on with it. So he had betrayed the relationship that he had with them. And of course, he'd also betrayed his relationship with God because it was God who'd called him. It was God who had appointed him to be king and to live by God's ways. So his transgression, his damaging of relationship isn't just with God, it's also with human beings. When we looked at the word iniquity, the Bible project told us that it was about crookedness. Isn't it interesting that that's actually what you would still use, the word crook? You know, it's maybe an old fashioned word, but it's still there, isn't it? Someone who's bent, you know, twisted in their behavior. Not straight and true. Now, David demonstrated that quite clearly when he plied Uriah with drink, trying to get him drunk, trying to persuade him to go home and, and, and be with his wife and enjoy time with her, hoping that if Uriah did that, then he would think the child that was already in her womb was his. That was twisted. David knew fine what he was doing. He was trying to cover his own tracks. It was really twisted thinking, wasn't it? And, and that same twisted thinking led him to decide that it would be okay to plot Uriah's death. This great soldier, this friend, yeah, I'll, I'll arrange to have him sent into battle into a place where he's most likely to die. No, his execution will take place and my hands won't be stained. That crookedness, that twistedness, that thinking, getting, getting out of order that can so happen when we're trying to protect ourselves. And as for David's sin, that sense of missing the mark, missing the target, well, that's so clear, isn't it? Here was David who'd been set apart as king, as ruler. God had promised that he would make David's name great. And he'd reminded David that he would be present with him at all times. 
And yet despite that, despite that very personal promise, David broke God's commands and then worked in a twisted manner to try to save himself. Yet despite all of that, David knew he could come back to God, his father. He knew that God was merciful and loving and forgiving. He knew that God wanted that relationship with him. He knew he'd done wrong. But finally, he decided to admit it. He decided to admit all that he had done, knowing that God knew already, because God had sent Nathan to reveal that to David. And why did God do that? Because God cared. God loved. And God knew that if David continued on that path, their relationship would become ever more strained, ever more distant. And God didn't want that. David confessed. He was honest before God. And he asked for forgiveness. Forgiveness that was undeserved, but forgiveness that was God's gift. Yeah, David didn't deserve to be forgiven, did he? But then none of us do. Forgiveness is the gift that enables a fresh start in life. It wipes the slate clean. We can leave that behind us, learn from it, and move on. The guilt is taken away, but the memory remains. Why doesn't God erase our memory? Because I think he wants us to learn from our past mistakes, not to carry the guilt, but so that we won't repeat the action. If David ever felt like committing adultery again, he had that reminder in his head. God is loving and forgiving. He wants us to learn. He doesn't want us to repeat the same errors, the same sin. But of course, often we do. We're like the child who keeps going back to the naughty step, having done the same naughty thing. When will we learn? The good news is we can come to God and he will wrap us in his arms despite all we've done wrong and say, I still love you. Let's get this right. God overshadows us. Let's reflect on that as we listen to holy overshadowing. Just for your information, there is a lovely setting of that with Graham Kendrick and Father's Song performing it. And you'll find that on YouTube if you would like to watch it. It doesn't have the lyrics underneath, which is why I didn't use it. Dave's going to read for us now the second part of Psalm 51, verses 10 to 17. Thanks, Dave. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt to God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Thank you very much, Dave. So 
we can see just in the second part of this psalm how David has changed, how confessing to God, knowing that his sins have been forgiven, has transformed him. He doesn't need to hide. It might not feel very comfortable meeting some other people, but it doesn't need to hide from God. Because God is the one who has heard his confession and has forgiven him. And David asked God to change him. Create in me a pure heart. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Grant me a willing spirit. David has opened himself up before God and says, I need you to fill me. I cannot do this by myself. I have messed up. You have forgiven me. But if I'm going to carry on in your path, I need your strength. This is a work, Father God, that only you can do. And I'm asking you to do it in me because I want to be found faithful. David was taking that fresh start that God offered him and he was taking it thankfully, but he was taking it in order that he could use that gift that he's been given to share God with others. He trusted that God would show mercy and God would continue to use his servant. Now in the New Testament, we read these words in 1 John chapter 1. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So that's what David discovered. But in John's letter, there is an additional teaching. We have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. We have an assurance that David didn't have because we know about Jesus' death and his resurrection. We know that he died for the forgiveness of our sins. And we know that he will take the punishment for our sin. We know that. David's confession came because he knew he'd grieved God. He had to go to God directly. There was no one else to take the punishment for him. He was falling down at God's mercy and asking that the punishment he deserved would not land on him. We know that that punishment has landed on Jesus. But just as David had that broken spirit, that contrite heart, as he confessed to God, so should we, even though we know that we will be forgiven. I wonder if sometimes we take that request for forgiveness too lightly. That's, a, that's a, a key question I think we need to ask ourselves. Do I go to God not feeling broken because of my sin, but go to confess my sin because I know he'll forgive me and I can move on? When we pray, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Do we use it sometimes as a blanket prayer, a catch-all? Well, I'm not really going to think about what I've done. I'm not really going to think about my sin. I'm just going to say, God, here's the basket full of them. And I'm asking you to forgive them. If we're doing that, then we're not reflecting upon our lives and we're not reflecting on how we have grieved God. We need to take time to look at our lives, look at the sin, look at the iniquity, look at the transgression, and name it before God. And then do something about it. 
and using the excuse that my sin isn't as serious as David's just doesn't wash because sin is sin and it's an offense against God no matter how severe we think it is anything that spoils us anything that spoils our relationship with God, anything that damages our relationship with other people grieves God. And it's sin. It might even just be that harsh word that you uttered. It's still sin. David confessed. David asked for a, a fresh start. And he received it. God was gracious and merciful as David prayed that he would be. But David then went on. He learned from his mistakes. Um, he made others, but he did learn. And this is what he said to his son Solomon. Just before David died. So Solomon was going to become king. David said to him, Observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in his ways and keep his decrees and commands, his law and his requirements. Put God first, was what David was saying. Don't put self first. And for all of us, that's what we have to ask ourselves when we look at our lives. Is it God first or is it self first? We are all sinners. Because of Jesus, we can all be forgiven sinners. And that's good news. But we shouldn't make light of our sin. We shouldn't just treat it as something we can't help doing. Paul reminds us, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. And that comes within a chapter in Romans where he wrote, shall we go on sinning? By no means. He doesn't miss the mark, does he? We do not want to go on sinning. We're engaged in a battle against sin. We're engaged against a battle against sin in our own lives. And God knows that. And he knows that at times we will fail. We will give in to the sinful side, the sinful nature. But God also knows that like David, we can learn from that sin. We confess, we ask for forgiveness, we turn from that sin, and we use the reminder that is in our heads not to do that again. Forgiveness means we don't carry the guilt, but the memory remains as a warning. In Proverbs, Chapter 28 at verse 13. Is this very useful proverb? He who conceals his sins does not prosper. But whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. That was David's experience. And may it be ours too. Before we go into our prayer groups, I'd like us just to take a moment on our own to reflect upon how we view our own sin. And if there's any sin that you want to bring before God right now in prayer, asking for his forgiveness and, and wanting to turn from that sin, then here's your opportunity.
Lord God, thank you that you are our loving Father. And thank you that you don't want there to be a barrier in our relationship with you. Thank you that as we confess our sin, you are faithful, you are just. And you do forgive sin. Thank you that Jesus came to take the punishment for our sin, that we might be forgiven. But help us not to view this as cheap grace. Help our heart's desire to be to walk away from sin in our lives, not towards it. We give you thanks that you love us so much that you do not want us to continue sinning. Thank you that we can know freedom. We can know a clean slate, a fresh page, a clean heart, a new beginning. Through Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. We're going to go into our prayer groups just now. Please bring anything before God that's on your heart just now. It might be the world. It might be within our community. Anything that's on your heart, please bring it to God in prayer with others. You'll be glad to know that I don't have a huge number of things to inform you of. Just to remind you to keep in your prayers, please, uh, on, in the coming weeks, um, the Holiday Club, uh, Chimp's plans for the Holiday Club being run very differently uh, this year through the month of July, but different things on different days for different ages. So it's a, it's a big undertaking. So please pray for that and all those involved. And continue to pray too for this, the way forward for us as a congregation, as a fellowship, and particularly if you could pray about how we're going to get back into the building because that is a really challenging issue at the moment. So apart from that, you know that worship continues in the same pattern, and it looks likely that through the summer months, the pattern will remain Sunday on, in Zoom and Wednesday in the building. But things might change when distancing changes, so pray for that too. We're going to close our praise uh, by singing, if you feel like singing, dancing, if you feel like dancing. Uh, we're going to sing, come people of the risen King, because that's who we are as followers of Jesus. We are people of the risen King who can rejoice, who can celebrate. Yeah, there are times of tears, times of mourning, but we can rejoice and celebrate because God is always with us and the Holy Spirit is always at work in our lives. Once we have sung this praise, and we've had a moment's quiet as we bless one another, then feel free to stay for coffee and a chat if you want to. And if not, then please continue your day knowing God's peace. So let's praise, come people of the risen King. We rejoice because God loves us. Jesus died for the forgiveness of our sin, and we have hope for today and all the days that lie ahead. Let's bless one another with the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and evermore. Amen.